Welcome to the CNO's Navy Birthday All Hands Call, broadcasting live from the Defense Media Activity Studios. I'm Petty Officer Andrew Johnson, and I'll be your host as we take questions from across the fleet and around the world. Joining me on stage is CNO Admiral Jonathan Greener and Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Mike Stevens. Gentlemen, thanks for spending some time with us. We know these shows have a tendency to start slow, so CNO, you mind breaking the ice for us? You are. Well, first of all, I'm glad to be here with my good friend and <laughs> shipmate. Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, and can't believe it's already been a year, and here we are back celebrating our 239th birthday at the Defense Media Activity in Fort Meade, uh, Maryland. Now, we're joined here in the studio audience from 10th Fleet, Nyock, Maryland, Navy District, Washington, uh, the Ceremonial Guard, the U.S. Naval Academy, anybody I missed, VX-1, of course, I almost missed VX-1. But we're joined around the world from uh, folks all around the globe the Navy writ large and the Navy globally, which reminds me we are out there, you are all out there where it matters, when it matters again. So 239 years of legacy, of tradition. And every time when the year comes around, we stop and we say, what does it all mean? So many people who went before us and made this all possible for us to serve with the kind of legacy, with the kind of tradition that we have those that made us able to be the finest Navy in the world as we are today, as you are today making it so. So where are we around the globe today? Can I put up the, that, uh, the first graphic if you might? Okay, as you can see, we have about 290 ships and tonight, today, we're, because we're global, it is night and day everywhere, we're all over the world. Uh, as the President indicated, we are continuing operations and will be for a while against ISIL, ISIL, ISIS, as you may, if you may, in the Arabian Gulf. And we have uh, the George Bush operating there with a host of ships out there. But at the same time, in the Mediterranean, we are protecting Eastern Europe and Israel, operating in the North uh, Sea, out in the uh, off AFRICOM, uh, and also uh, in, the, in the UCOM area of responsibility. We're in the Western Pacific, assuring our allies and conducting operations with our allies and, and making sure that that freedom of navigation that keeps our economy going so strong is open and operating. In the Southern Command uh, area of responsibility, we're conducting counter drug ops and counter terrorism operations as well, counter smuggling. Around the world, getting the job done where it matters, when it matters. And as you can see, the centerpiece of what we do today and what we'll continue to do is sea duty. And uh, we've, we've recognized that recently. We've made some changes accordingly. It's arduous duty for many. And uh, CPAY is the center of gravity, and that's why we increased CPAY this year. Uh, deployments have increased some, and we should acknowledge that. And we have recently with uh, hardship duty pay tempo, which we're providing for people who go beyond, again, that seven-month uh, issue, uh, that seven-month period of time. So, Mick Palm, why don't you say a few words, and we'll open up and see what people have on their minds. See, you know, it's hard to believe that a year, as you just said, that a year went by yeah. already. Uh, I would just like to say thank you to our sailors, uh, shipmates, family members around the world, whether it's morning, day, or night, for joining us here today for this all-hands call. And I'd also like to thank all the members here in the audience for being here with us, and congratulations to our shipmates that just re-enlisted. Yeah. Not just to you, but we re-enlist the families as well. Yeah, we do. So, sure. so thank you for giving them permission to re-enlist. So, you know, these uh, all-hands calls uh, tend to run out on us pretty quick. Uh, I know there's lots of questions to be asked, and I look forward to, uh, with you, to answering some of these questions. So, I think... Uh, I've said about enough, and I'm ready to get started. Before, Before we do, do the, the first, first question, I almost forgot. The theme of our birthday, the theme of our celebration, is thanking those who support us, which you absolutely just mentioned. Uh, we just spoke to the families. Of course, they're the primary, the, the wind under our wings, as we like to say. But it's our friends. It's organizations such as the Navy League and others who take care of us. But it's our communities who support our sailors out there all around the world. And you know what makes Sea Power, uh, the technological piece of it, so great? Our industrial partners. Mm -hmm. So all of that this year, we're going to take the moment and say thanks for. But to your point, let's get some questions. We ready to go? Absolutely, all right. gentlemen. All right. Yes, well, thank you much. We do have a live studio audience. We're also streaming live on Navy.mil. But we encourage you to join the conversation on social media. And standing by in our social media studio, MC1 Brandy Wills. Hey Johnson, I am standing by here with these four wonderful individuals. We are waiting to take your questions. We're actually already vetting questions, getting some answers out as quickly as we can. 
But uh, I got some questions in already via email, which you can shoot us your questions. Email us at socialmedia at navy.mil. Tweet us your questions using the hashtag allhandscall. Or hit us up on Facebook, on the US Navy's Facebook page, and, and get your questions out there. But on email, I got a question from ABH1 Dennis Delarama from USS Harry S. Truman. And he wants to know if the Navy is thinking about entertaining a 15-year retirement for those sailors who are willing to separate. Well, uh, we, are not, uh, we are not entertaining a 15-year retirement as we think of retirement pay. But periodically, uh, if we want to make what we call a force shaping, and this would be a voluntary, uh, uh, if you will, process or, or a voluntary authorization, we sometimes enable people to, uh, to retire at the 15-year point. But that wouldn't be a statutory long-range kind of thing where instead of 20 years, it's 15 years, and we just fundamentally redo retirements. Mick Pond, any comments on it? See, you know, I'm interested to see what the retirement military pay compensation and retirement commission presents uh, to the president, to Congress, and DOD with respects to future retirement. And who knows what they're going to offer. We'll just have yeah. to wait and see. Yeah. Good, Good point. point. All right. Well, let's take it back to the fleet. We're going to DDG 57. We've got a phone caller from USS Mitcher. Mitcher, go ahead with your question. Hi, with the recent events in Syria, have there been any thoughts on restoring hazardous duty pay to sailors in the Fifth Fleet or adjacent AORs? Yeah, uh, I would say hazardous duty pay uh, and the need for it and the requisite, uh, the, the, are, the uh, issues that, that require it uh, are under review. Uh, they'll do this about annually, and they're definitely going to do it as a result of these operations. But as it stands now, uh, it is not determined to be needed. Uh, the folks who are steaming today out in the Arabian Gulf and conducting those operations uh, are not viewed to be, in, in, if you will, under the circumstances of hazardous duty pay. But we'll continue to take a look at that uh, year by year. It's, it's really conducted by Central Command uh, in that regard. All right, and for some, some pleasant duty, we're going to sunny San Diego via satellite. San Diego, go ahead with your question. Good backdrop. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Junior Grade Eccleston from Fibron 3 in San Diego. I was wondering, with the last year or so when we've done the Sapper F and Sapper L training, uh, and we had to have 100% accountability from all commands across the Navy, have we had a decrease at all in sexual assault cases? And if not, what is the plan to combat this across our Navy? Nick Pot, you want to go first? Sure. The, uh, the, the data that we're receiving right now with regards to sexual assault, sexual assault prevention, shows that we are uh, moving in the right direction. It's certainly not where we want to be, but yes, there has been uh, an indication or the numbers are showing that the numbers of sexual assaults are decreasing, uh, but we should not take that as uh, let's sit on our laurels. We need to continue to work hard, be diligent, uh, and ensure that our sailors are properly educated and that bystander intervention program is working well. Uh, as we continue CNO to combat uh, this crime of sexual assault. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, this is going to be a long effort. It's, it's going to be a campaign. A year is not enough time. Here's what we do know. More people are willing to come forward to support, uh, to, excuse me, to report uh, sexual assault. Uh, the events, the assault, the alleged assault we're finding uh, has a legacy. In other words, folks, these are happening well before uh, the, the event, uh, the, the date, if you will, and they're up to 90 days, sometimes two years. So people are coming forward. The, the proclivity to come forward uh, is increasing. And so uh, we're finding that, that that's a good step in the right direction. Uh, we find that on surveys, et cetera, folks are willing uh, to, to discuss it. Folks uh, think the training is better and that the commands are taking it seriously. These, this is feedback we're getting from a whole number of sailors out there. So. Uh, the arrows are in the right direction, but we got direction. We got a lot of work to do. You know, so, you know, uh, if I could add one piece to that, because it's such an important topic, uh, I don't uh, underestimate the value of the direct feedback that we get from our people in the fleet and those that are working to combat this, uh, that are wearing uh, the cloth of our civilian sailors. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question to our experts. Uh, I said, data aside, do you believe that the numbers? of sexual assaults that are occurring are going down. And what I receive from them, as they think about it deeply, they share with me, yes, I believe that we are making improvements. Certainly, we've got a lot of work to do, yeah. they tell me, 
what they believe that we're making improvements. And that's not, that's not something we see physically in numbers, but we have to take serious, I think, the uh, empirical feedback that we get yeah. from our experts. Yeah. Well, well as, as many of you know, we just completed a, a Department of Defense-wide survey, uh, which is uh, entitled uh, Re Gender Relations in the Department of Defense. And it's really about what's the prevalence, what's the proclivity, are you willing to intercede, uh, and we'll get a lot from that, but we've got to continue, as you said, to get as much empirical and objective data as possible. Absolutely, that was a great question. a great question. For our next one, we're going to be using Skype. We're headed out to Old Ironsides. Constitution, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Mick Pond, I'm Seaman Wesley Bishop from USS Constitution. And my question is, is any effort being made to redesign boot camp specifically to refocus it on its traditional role of instilling in recruits the ideal of mission, ship, shipmate self, and the subordination of the self to the unit? I would say absolutely. And then I want you to talk sure. about East Sailor. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, the, the, we review uh, the, the curricula for boot camp all the time. And in fact, the very, very attributes uh, that the sailor just brought in uh, are being turned and put into boot camp. Uh, we look at other recruit training. We look at what do we want in the character of the sailor of today? What do we want in the ethical nature uh, of the sailor today? What are we missing in the fleet? And we've got to, to strive to get that in there today. So it's about unit, not self. The good news is those that join today, that exactly resonates with what most of our kids that join the military and especially kids that join the Navy today. Well, as CNO shares, we're never satisfied with where we're at and we're always looking for opportunities to get better. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we're doing at RTC right now, in December we will start uh, to issue a uh, portable mobile wireless device to our new recruits. We're going to start with about 200 sailors. They'll get these devices and all the paperwork, if you will, the manuals like the recruit training manual and uh, then Blue Jackets manual and those sorts of things are going to be downloaded onto this mobile device so that everything they need is ready and available all the time. We're also working to provide them with a level of connectivity so that you'll have an option to either write a letter and put it in an envelope during your letter writing time or you'll be able to shoot an email home and receive an email. And we're going to take that feedback. Mind you, this is just a beta test. We'll take that feedback from our sailors and we'll make a decision on how to best go forward with this data that we receive. Uh, but if you don't put your toe in the water, it's going to be very difficult to swim in the future. So we've got to start somewhere. Yeah. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's start with our first pre-recorded question coming to us from the fleet. Hello, sir. I'm Seaman Michael Brian Kelly, stationed on the USS McCampbell in Yakuska, Japan. And I'd like to know what the plans are for bringing back more port visits for foreign deployed ships. <laughs> now he's talking our tune, huh? Yeah. See the world, right? Good question. Uh, good point. What we want to do, we want to get into more ports in the Western Pacific, where the forward deployed naval force is, especially this kid uh, was talking about uh, from the McCampbell. What we want to do is we want to get into uh, ports in Vietnam. We want to get into ports uh, in um, Malaysia more, in Indonesia more, and these gov in the Philippines. And these governments are in favor of that. We have to do it in a deliberate manner. There's a diplomatic aspect. Uh, when you visit a port, you have to make sure you have proper legal protection, uh, things called a status of force agreement where it applies. So we want to do more of it. Uh, it's a matter of budget, time location, mission, but reassuring allies, building new allies, building new partners, and having our sailors, who are the best ambassadors we got going, right. interface and show what real Americans are like, what the face of America is, that always works out well for us, uh, is a mission, a big mission, especially in the Western Pacific, uh, as well as in the Indian Ocean through Africa. Well, if hashtag all hands call wasn't trending already, I think talking port visits might have sped us up yeah, a little bit. Do something for us, right? Let's take our first question from the studio audience. Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Master Hello. Chief. I'm Seaman Kirk Johnson, and I was wondering, Master Chief, if you could please explain the difference between uh, PTS and the Seaway Point, and if you think it should be based more on a command level than Big Navy with the regulations. Well, we have to understand that uh, that. Both of those programs are designed, were designed to help ensure that we have the proper balance and that we're managing uh, our communities correctly. 
Uh, CNO uh, made a decision along with Chief of Naval Personnel some time ago to step away from uh, PTS and move into something that was a little bit more personal, uh, that afforded uh, sailors and commands to interact uh, at a, in a greater way and to give uh, NPC, our Naval Personnel Command, greater flexibility when it came to uh, how we determine who is able to reenlist and continue service. Uh, I was just in Millington, Tennessee, uh, getting a good brief, a, an overview of the process, uh, not a general overview, but an in-depth uh, overview of the process. Uh, we believe that where we're at right now with it uh, is, is yielding good results, yeah. that our sailors are overwhelmingly happy with it. Uh, there are still a few of those rates out there that are slightly overmanned that we're trying to get to the proper size and and manage correctly for the good of our sailors and for our Navy uh, as a whole. Uh, so I, th I think that um, what you're seeing across the fleet, again, is general, sa general satisfaction to a large degree, uh, and that commands do have the opportunity, especially the sailors, to be a part of the decision-making process. And we'll continue to work on it like we do everything, as we talked about with boot camp. Uh, we'll continue to work on it and help it to evolve and get better over time. So we're not satisfied exactly with where we're at, but we're pretty happy and we'll continue to make improvements. Okay, you're welcome. Chair. Absolutely, great question. We're off to a wonderful start. Let's check back in with MC1 Wills and social media. Thanks a lot, Petty Officer Johnson. I am here with Tarina Weatherspoon. She is monitoring the All Hands Magazine Facebook page where questions are also coming in. We got a question from Walter Quinones. He wants to know, is there a new MCPON guidance for the fiscal year 16 CPO 365? Oh, uh, funny that you should ask that question. <laughs> Did you plan that? <laughs> I actually didn't plan it, but uh, uh, I was talking with, uh, with Master Chief Garrison, my uh, EA there in the MCPON's office, yeah. and I said to him, I said, Jeff, I don't want to make any changes this year. Yeah. I said, we're going to change the date, and we're going to leave it just like it is, because we believe, one, that it's pretty darn effective the way it is now. Mm -hmm. And CNO, you've heard me share with the audiences before, is that I want to give it some soak time. Yeah. Get our, let our sailors get used to the process, because it is a new process. Uh, but I will say I would like to share with our audience that that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to recommendations. I'm not inclined to make changes, but if someone comes to me with an aha uh -huh yeah. type of uh, recommendation, then we'll certainly entertain that. But other than that, I want to leave it alone, let our Chiefs First Classes uh, continue to move forward with what we consider to be a very successful process uh, and let them get acclimated and used to it before we make any changes. Makes sense. Okay? Excellent. All right. Let's move right along to another pre-recorded question. This one coming from USS Gonzalez. CTT, SN, Kelly Atwell, USS Gonzalez hometown Iowa Park, Texas. Sir, how will the events in the Middle East affect upcoming deployments? Well, for now and for the near future, I don't think that events in the Middle East, and I think you're referring to operations in Syria uh, and, uh, and, and Iraq, uh, I don't think they will affect uh, our deployments in the near term. Uh, as recent as last Friday, we had a discussion, will there be the need for more forces, especially more naval forces uh, in the Central Command? The answer was no, not at this time. What we have is, is just fine. We come sort of self-contained. We say we deploy where it matters, when it matters, uh, ready to do a whole myriad of missions. Some of those missions were called upon a few weeks ago as we started this operation out. We started it out with uh, a cruiser and a destroyer and an air wing right after that were already on deployment. We're continuing those operations with the ships that are there today. And I see that for the near future, uh, perhaps for the midterm. Uh, we will be busy over there, but I think uh, additional forces, extended uh, deployments, I don't see that right now. Absolutely. Another great question. Let's move on to a live satellite feed from Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. Good morning, sir. Mick Bond. My name is 82 Huell on board the USS Harry S. Truman. And my question for you is this. Throughout the fleet, the relationship between officers and enlisted personnel is regarded as a high priority. Through the f over the past few years, there has been a push to reinforce the leadership qualities of the Chief Petty Officers through the CPO 365 program. Sir, I would like to know, what programs do we have in place for officers to ensure that they receive the same type of training? Yeah, that's a good question. We've taken the lessons, actually, that we learned from CPO 365 
Uh, we've put this into our NROTC units, our officer candidate school, and our Naval Academy. And that lesson is right off the bat, uh, you know who your mentor is when you get there? It's your chief. How many, uh, I, can't, I can't imagine any officer, in fact, I've never come across, certainly a flag officer, who hasn't said, you know why I'm here today? You know why I was a successful officer? Because it was chief fill in the blank. For me, it was Chief Shellhammer. You know, uh, I'll never forget Chief Bill Shellhammer, machinist mate chief, who, who really uh, embedded in me leadership traits. So it's building a relationship uh, between the CPO mess and the junior officer corps. But it's also making sure that junior officer corps understands just how important they are to, to your development and also to what you owe to them, the covenant that you have. That's also embedded in as we go to basic training, basic uh, surface warfare officer school, uh, naval aviation, uh, submarine for across the communities. We're also looking at modules. I call them modules because as we go from a, a, an officer, an 01 to an 04, the expectations for that 04 are different from the 01, just as you have different from an E7 to an E9, very much different. To make sure they understand what kind of character do we expect you to develop, what kind of uh, ethical natures do you have, do you have to have uh, ethical characteristics, if you will, and what do you now owe? You've learned so much, you've got to roll that back into that CPO quarters. And then eventually, if you're lucky enough to get command, how you nurture and develop with your command master chief a CPO quarters and a wardroom that operate together as a team to develop the sailors, such as we have in this room and in the sound of my voice. Absolutely wonderful. Keeping with the live trend, let's go to Millington, Tennessee. Millington, go ahead with your question. Good morning, Admiral. Good morning, Mick Pond. I'm IT1 Dimple Bimley, CNRC Millington. My question is coming from your sailing directions navigational plan. Once the economy has been restored and the fiscal year has been recovered, will you then increase the number of submarines, which you have stated that you will decrease by 2028? Uh, absolutely. If I, if I have the money, we will build more submarines. Uh, but what you can't do is you can't overcome a, a, a momentum uh, which is undergoing, which we're undergoing right now, which is we built in the 80s, uh, about 30 years ago, mid-80s, three to four submarines a year. Those three to four submarines that we built a year are now coming up on retirement at the rate of three to four submarines a year. Our industrial base that builds submarines, their sweet spot is to build between two and two and a half submarines a year. So if we continue to build at two to two and a half submarines a year and we, we produce those, we'll eventually catch up. But what we can't stop is a, a dip, if you will, in the submarine force structure that's going to take place between uh, about 2024 and about 2034. So you can't overcome that momentum, uh, regardless of how much money you have, because you can only build submarines as fast as the industrial base can do it. But we have to keep at it. We have to build at least two a year to two sweet spots, two and a half, to get to that point where we will recover from this slow, this uh, kind of a subtle degrade, if you will, uh, as uh, she mentioned, till we build back up to the force we need, which is uh, 45 to 55 submarines. Absolutely. All right, so back to the West Coast, this time via Skype to Everett, Washington. Everett, go ahead with your question. Good morning, sir. Good morning, McFond. I am MMT Lewis Jewell, Naval Station Everett, Washington. I have heard some information about the female dress blue uniforms being put out soon. Um, my question is when and how will those be implemented to all hands, as well as how will that affect the pregnancy female dress blue uniform? Sure. The, so right now with the dress blue uniform for our E6 and below for our women, uh, we're conducting a test. Uh, and I believe that test is being conducted down in the Hampton Roads area. It's a small test and when we conclude that test and we're gonna expand it, we're gonna take what we learned from that and then we're gonna expand that test uh, and once we've completed both of those tests, then we'll assess the best way to proceed forward. I will say, what we're trying to do is ensure that, you know, we would rather get this right late than wrong early. Yeah. So we wanna make sure that we don't do something and then have to turn around and do something else because we didn't think through all the challenges. And one of the things that we got to be mindful of is the maternity uniform and make sure that we have a uniform uh, that fits those needs and those requirements. So we do not have a date, an exact date of when that uniform is going to roll out to the fleet, 
because again, it's more, more important for us to get this right than to assign a date to it. Fit, quality, and good wear. <laughs> and uniform is always a hot topic. All right, oh, yeah. next question. We'll go pre-recorded to Guam. Hello, McPon. My name is IT3 Eric McMahon from NTS, NCTS Guam, and I would like to ask you a question. For those of us looking to stay in the Navy for 20 more years, what's your advice? Well, this, so the, the question is pre-recorded, but let's be clear, I didn't know what he was going to ask me, right? Uh, but I have an answer for you. I would like to share with you what I call the foundation to success. It's about three things, and it's about doing these three things with excellence. Number one, it's working hard. Every single day, regardless of the task that you're assigned, uh, it's about doing your very best every time you're assigned a task. Number two, stay out of trouble. You can work hard, you can do the right thing for many, many years. You can get in trouble one time and you can compromise all that hard work. So stay out of trouble. Number three, and I believe to be the most important of all the foundation to success uh, pieces that I talk about, is be a good and decent person. Be a good and decent person to yourself, to your family, and to your shipmates, and never to forget to always treat one another with dignity and respect. Work hard, stay out of trouble, be a good and decent person, and shipmate, you're well on your way to a successful 20 years. Thank you for the question. And by the way, McPon, that's what I tell the worker. <laughs> it's a pretty good, pretty good set of principles. We'll set you up right there, set you up. So back to the West Coast. This time, let's go live satellite feed from San Diego. San Diego, go ahead with your question. Good morning, Admiral. Good morning, Master Chief. Hey. Uh, my name is QM1 Pokel, stationed on board the USS Boxer here in San Diego. First of all, I just want to thank you both for the visit on our last appointment. We definitely appreciated the encouragement during the holiday season last year. Uh, my question is for the CNO, sir. With the Navy's changing budget and personnel needs, do you see an increase in programs like State 21 for the Navy to develop that leadership within the enlisted ranks of the Navy? Well, I see uh, an increase in that program commensurate with uh, a change in on our personnel. Uh, we have been growing, frankly, the, uh, the amount of people in the, in the Navy, the officer corps, as well as enlisted, uh, to where we are today at about 325. So that, that's uh, something that, that really is set upon the force structure in the Navy. In other words, we man equipment. We buy the number of ships and aircraft and CB battalions, uh, NECC, squadrons, all of that. We buy what we need and then we man that. So we man equipment. So it, again, it's really commensurate with uh, what is the size of the Navy. And so State 21, uh, ratio-wise, it's about right now. I don't see a big change in that. So follow, if you will, the force structure of the Navy, and you follow the changes in that program. All right, thank you, gentlemen. All right, moving on to the fleet, let's go to a pre-recorded from Japan. Hello, Nick Pond. Hospital Corpsman Christopher Rivera, stationed in Niwa Hospital, Yokosuka, Japan. Uh, my question is, will there be any incentives for people to score higher in the PRT? And also, will the PRT results weigh more in the evaluation and the advancement exam in the near future? It's a good question, Shipmate, and I enjoyed my visit uh, out in your area uh, in the spring, and thanks, thanks for uh, bringing up this topic, because there's some information floating around out in the fleet that's talking a lot about changes to the Navy's PRT program. And what I'd like everybody to know is that right now there are no planned changes with our PRT program in any way doesn't mean that we're not looking at how to make improvements and that, it, and that something may come in the future, but what we're not doing is making changes today. Uh, we've got uh, some important things that we need to be focused on. This is obviously an important area, but we don't believe that we need to make changes at this particular time. So rest easy. What's in the instruction will remain in the instruction for the foreseeable future. And if we decide that there's changes that need to be made, we'll vet that through the fleet and leadership properly and make sure that you have plenty of advance notice. So you know there's a lot of angst about this discussion that's going on out there with changes to PRT. And we keep talking about it, but they keep asking the question. I know. And, uh, so. I, I think this will, this will go on forever, <laughs> as long as people are studying. Absolutely. We're just getting started and we've already hit half the good button topic. So we'll just see. I'm sure we got some more for you. Yeah, Moving next, okay. let's go to a live satellite feed from Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. 
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Master Chief. Hello. This is EM3 Yerger from the USS Harry S. Truman. In light of the end of our recent 2014 deployment, quite, sailors on the USS Harry S. Truman were wondering if there is any chance of the retroactive benefits that the George H.W. Bush is enjoying for their extended deployment being transferred to the USS Harry S. Truman, if we're being considered for that. Well, uh, trust me, if I could do that, I would do that. We've been working on um, the ability, as I mentioned in my opening, to be sure that we reward sea duty appropriately and that we accommodate folks who are on longer deployments, seven, greater than uh, seven months as a notion of time. But regrettably, until we, we have to only reward, we're only authorized to award that uh, period from when it goes into effect and forward, which was just a few weeks ago. So. Uh, Sorry about that, but uh, it's something that we would love to do if we could, if we had the authority. Absolutely. Moving right along, let's go check back in with MC1 Wills over in our social media studio. Hey, MC2. Social media is just absolutely on fire in here. We got questions coming in left and right. <laughs> and we got one that came in via Twitter. I am not even going to try to pronounce this name because I don't want to butcher it. But he wants to know, are cyber warriors to information dominance like battleships are to Mayhan sea power? Yes, yes. Uh, cyber people are our weapons in cyber. Uh, cyber is alive today, I mean, is active today. Uh, if we go on over, we got Nyack here, right? Can I hear from Nyack, Maryland? <laughs> you see, these people are animals. <laughs> Today, uh, there is a lot of activity. Uh, all, our networks, let me make be simple. Our networks are under, uh, if you will, attack. They are being probed every day. All of our networks, official and unofficial, uh, are being probed every day, attempted to be exploited and to extrapolate information from. It's done by hackers. It's done by national. And there are people, cyber warriors, every day out there protecting those networks. These networks are combat systems. They are the means to command and to control. They are the means to deliver information. They are the means to deliver uh, uh, sensor information to be able to deliver weapons. If uh, they are uh, hacked into, if they are contaminated, if they are exploited, uh, we're in trouble. We will not be able to do our job. As I look into the future, uh, I am positive that he or she that controls information will control, uh, will have the upper hand if not control the outcome of, of future conflict. Cyber warriors uh, are, if not the battleships, because remember, battleships are replaced by carriers not long after Mahan. But for what it's worth, they are truly uh, a major, major part of our Navy uh, and, a, and of our Navy capabilities, uh, offensive and defensive for the future. All right, our next question, we've got a caller from Kuwait at 11th Mil our Mar Marine Expeditionary Unit. Caller, go ahead with your question. Uh, good afternoon, Admiral McPine, HMC Timothy L. Whitaker, 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit 11, Kuwait. Sir, and uh, McPine, my question pertains to the SAPA program, and I know that we made great, great strides over the years to address um, sexual harassment and sexual assault, um, but do you have anything in the works to better, to better inform our junior and senior officer and enlisted on um, the rules and regulations and possibly a training team that will help um, to better um, assist our sailors and Marines in understanding the rules? Sure. Well, first, let me say that it's important for all of us to be familiar with the policies that are currently in existence. And also, I want you to know that um, CNO and I get an opportunity to sit on meetings and be a part of discussions uh, on a regular basis where we're always looking at how to make improvements. I've never heard anybody say we've, we've reached a point where we believe we've got it right. Yeah. We're always saying, what else can we do and how can we do it better? Uh, one example is the new training that's being rolled out where we're doing more peer-to-peer -peer and small group discussions. I remember CNO, you and I talking about that in one of the meetings uh, about what are sailors interested in and how do they want to see this training. And we talked about the small group. And you talked with leadership and leadership came back and provided you feedback and you know, now here we are doing the small group training. Yeah. So uh, everybody's open to suggestions and ideas because, hey, the fleet knows better than anybody what it is we need to do and how to get this right. So please continue to provide us with, with your feedback and understand and believe and know 
uh, that we're going to continue to work on this. As CNO has told me many times, it's the challenge of our time. And we can never stop working on this, and we will continue that effort. I meet with my uh, four stars once a quarter, uh, virtually. We do a video teleconference. Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Head Lawyer, Chief of Information, and, uh, and uh, Fleet Forces Command, Compact Fleet, Commander Naval Forces Europe. You get my point. And we talk about, so how are we doing? What do we need to do at headquarters to make the situation better, to enable our leaders out there to deal with this challenge better? It's an uncomfortable topic, and people are not as free to talk about it as we would like. So we depend a lot on, on surveys. We depend a lot on feedback from SAPR representatives, from training teams that go out into the fleet. And frankly, some say, you know, I'm kind of, we're talking way too much about it. You're overwhelming me with all this. Uh, I would tell you, I'm happy to dial back any kind of uh, policy changes, any kind of uh, other, you know, to and from, back and forth. Uh, whenever things sort of are proceeding along and there's nothing more we can do, there's, you know, as you said before, the, that the dynamics slow down and now we just get after this thing in a, you know, a slow, methodical manner. But until that time, we need to be listening, we need to be willing and ready to help enable those who are trying cases, uh, adjudicating cases, to enable victims to be able to come forward, to feel comfortable, and to train folks out there to understand the significance of the challenge. So the quality of the effort more than the quantity of the effort yes. is the sir. Absolutely. So the great question, one that we probably could have done the entire show on. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to head back out to San Diego. San Diego, go ahead with your question. Uh, good morning, Admiral uh, Mick Pond. My name is Operations Specialist Third Class Nicholas Mahone. I am on the USS Russell DDG-59 based in San Diego, California, and my question was for the Chief of Naval Operations. Sir, uh, we understand that op tempo has doubled in the past six years, and at the same time, the Navy has continued to downsize. And so we understand that puts a lot of stress on uh, sailors maintaining their mental and physical preparedness as well as their family lives. And we know there's a greater need for uh, more ships to be in theater. And we're just wondering, sir, with the uh, ever-growing dire need to defend the nation here at home and the global front, what exactly is being done to reciprocate those sacrifices made by the uh, sailors who are doing their duties and uh, having to work more hours and doing what is basically more demanded? Okay, uh, I would, uh, I need to understand the, the facts and figures, but uh, op-tempo Dublin is uh, not what we're seeing right now, but it is higher uh, than it has been. Uh, our op-tempo, uh, w represented, if you will, by deployment life and uh, deployment length, excuse me, and time uh, away from home uh, has actually grown from uh, roughly uh, uh, home tempo, in other words, time home, uh, from about uh, 63, 64 percent. It's down to somewhere like 51, 52 percent, and our our red line is 50 percent. So we want to get that back up to 63, 64, 67 percent time at home in a 36 month, that's our measuring, 36 months of operations, that's maintenance, that's training, that's preparation for deployment and deployment. How much time are you in, in your home, should be uh, in your home port for sure, and, uh, and uh, hopefully in your, at home in, uh, in your home of residence. So we want to increase that, so we need to stabilize the process. So I mentioned this a little bit as we, start, as we opened it. Make sure we have enough time for maintenance. Make sure we have enough time for training. Make sure the people who are going to get to the unit get to the unit not right before deployment, but in time to work the team up so that you can cycle through and get your, get your schools done. And then uh, as we get through this period where we had sequestration, where we had really unstable budgets, the world always gets a vote, uh, and we are able to accommodate all that and get out into the late 15 and 16 and 17 time frame, to lay those deployments in with this optimized fleet response plan uh, to get a more predictable schedule. We are laying that in. We have the people numbers right. We have to now distribute them and reduce the gaps at sea. That's on track. We have to make sure we got enough maintenance capacity in the shipyards, public and private, nuclear work and private work. We have funded that. We have to now sit down and make sure that our training is not duplicative. We're not doing one inspection on top of another so that you're not doing pre-deployment underway time willy-nilly and, and needlessly. We're on track to do that. So all of these have to be in place. But in the end, as I mentioned at the opening, sea duty has to be the center of gravity, and folks have to be compensated for it. 
Uh, they should be promoted for, for sustained superior performance at sea, and you've worked with that with, uh, with our, uh, our uh, performance specifications mm -hmm. and promotions. And then C do, uh, C pay uh, has recently been increased. And then if, if there's the people on deployment beyond the notional time of seven months, well, they should be accommodated. And that's hardship duty pay, which we just recently put in effect. Mm -hmm. He mentions, uh, I think he mentions what we're doing for families as well as sailors with these increased uh, deployments, uh, the lengths of deployments and uh, periodicity. Uh, and you've mentioned CNO on a number, of time, a number of occasions that you're not willing to accept risk in the areas of family readiness. Those support programs, given the budget that we receive, you've always uh, pushed to support that to the highest degree possible to make sure that the families are taken care of as well when they're deployed. So not, not a lot, lot of money, money it's high payback, payback. Mm -hmm. uh, those, those family, family support programs. programs. You're right. Absolutely. Incentives, another one to help us get trending with that hashtag all hands call. Our next question is coming from Millington, Tennessee. Millington, go ahead with your question. Good morning, Admiral. Good morning, Mick Pond. IT3 Dennis Ward from Millington, Tennessee, NRC. I have a question that goes to the CNO. In recent years, our allies in NATO and the European Union have been scaling down their defense spending. Do you think this is a move towards increased reliance on U.S. military might? And if so, do you think that we can convince them to be more self-reliant in future conflicts? Well, I don't know if, it was, if it's been uh, this reduced budget, which is factual, uh, with our NATO allies is purposeful to shift the burden over to the United States, but it certainly has occurred that way. Uh, recently, there was a NATO summit after the Russian incursion into Crimea and into the Ukraine. The NATO nations came together and had a summit. They had it in Wales and the United Kingdom. And coming out of that, it was a commitment by the NATO nations to arrest the reduction in their defense budget and in many cases to increase. Uh, we'll see how that transpires. That's something that our nation, that our president, that uh, our secretary of defense, all of it, try to encourage our NATO partners to increase their defense budget to strengthen them and to show the resolve that is so important to make that alliance, the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a strong and a good deterrent for future instability in both, uh, both in Europe and in Africa. All right, our next question is coming to us from USS Arlington. Caller, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, Admiral. Good afternoon, um, Master Chief. My question is, is there any plan on the part of the Navy to have an expanded presence in the Middle East to counteract the efforts of ISIS in Iraq? No, there's no plan right now to have an increase in presence. Uh, the distribution of forces today is good. Uh, we have uh, just over 100 ships deployed. About 30% of those, are, that is about 30, 32 I think is the number are in the Middle East, and that's about right. We are where it matters, when it matters. We have the requisite forces, but more important, capabilities to answer the call for those capabilities that the Central Command commander uh, says is needed for this ISIS campaign that is ongoing. All right, let's take another question from our studio audience. Go ahead with your question. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Good morning Master Chief. Morning. My name is uh, Seaman Bracci. I'm with the Ceremonial Guard. Master Chief, this is a question for you. Um, understand that the female uniforms are changing. Is there any thoughts about the male uniform? We don't have uh, any big changes in store for the uniforms that our, our male sailors are wearing. Uh, I think it's important, as I've mentioned throughout this, uh, this all hands call, to understand that because there is no changes planned doesn't mean changes won't come. Because we have a responsibility to always be looking at how to improve the process. Uh, there, there is some work that's taken place right now um, with the uh, flame-resistant coveralls. Uh, we're trying to determine uh, the best product to roll out uh, with that particular uniform. There's some minor changes that are going to be occurring with uh, the, the jumper, the dress blue uniforms. But I take your question more so as a you know, significant uniform change, new types of uniforms. And uh, that's not occurring, but we're certainly looking at ways to make the uniforms you're currently in uh, uh, better to wear. When I say better to wear, I mean comfort and fit and ensure that it provides you with the safety uh, that you deserve and, frankly, that we should be providing you. Okay? All right, headed back to Norfolk for another live question. Norfolk, go ahead. 
Good morning, sir. Good morning, McPond. Ellis Three Moore from USS Harry S. Truman. My question for you is, in regards to current world events, what is the possibility of going to a two-carrier presence in the Central Command AOR? Well, I don't think it's likely in the near term. The, uh, the number of aircraft that, that our air wing on a carrier, one carrier, provide has been adequate to meet all of the uh, air support that, is, that the Navy has requested to, to provide. Um, I would not be in favor of going to two carriers uh, in the Arabian Gulf. Uh, that's, that's hard on our ability to, to sustain presence worldwide. However, we'll see what, what portends are what, out there. But I don't see it right now. We have a lot of the right forces in theater, a lot of capability, especially with one air wing there. So for now, one carrier strike group. All right, our next question is a caller from USS Macon Island. Macon Island, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, Admiral McPon. I'm CTT-1 Pater from USS Macon Island. Um, our ship is very proactive with the Women at Sea program, and I feel as though the women on board, including myself, have benefited from the program in some way. And I have, however, asked several women if they have seen this program active at other commands, and the answer is usually no. And with retention rates low for women in the Navy, this program may be one way for us to boost those numbers by increasing advertisement and awareness and encouraging commands to take a more active role with this program. What are your thoughts on the Women at Sea program? Uh, it's, it's a, a terrific, terrific program. I frankly was not aware of it until about six months ago. And uh, it's a terrific way. If, if you, you have to have sort of what some call the critical mass, enough women to make it worthwhile such that they will come together. They can come together. There are enough of them periodically talk about uh, what they want to do, how, how to uh, interact, deal with unique issues. You have to have a decent rank structure, experts tell me so that you can do nurturing, you can do mentoring, and make it worthwhile. However, uh, the Macon Island is an example of it working correctly. Uh, I've seen your logo, I've seen your process, I've seen your results, uh, Macon Island, and congratulations on that. Uh, it should be exported, and uh, we're working on that, but again, some of these attributes that I speak to to make it effective uh, are not necessarily easily laid on a, on a smaller unit. Uh, but if, you, if you're talking about probably a, an, amp, an LPD kind of size, that mm -hmm. kind of size crew and better, uh, it, it's, it's a good idea. But how to develop that to a smaller unit, we have to look at. But the characteristics and the endeavors are definitely, they speak for themselves. So, you know, I'd like to ask a question with a question. Um, or answer a question with a question uh, so for our shipmate on the Macon Island in in uh, 10 seconds or less, 15 seconds or less, uh, since you have, you're a part of an active program and it's working well for your ship, uh, what is something that you would recommend to our audience uh, during this period of time? I would recommend um, women definitely meeting um, regularly. Um, on, on Board Making Island, we meet regularly as a group. Um, we discuss topics that um, we think that would benefit women um, at sea or onshore. Um, I really think just the advertisement, getting women involved, um, is where it starts. And so if you have a productive team um, that are willing to do that, I, I really think that's where, where it starts. So get the team together, start a discussion, and see where that takes you. And get command support. Get exactly. command support. Absolutely. See, I, I believe, make it on you. My understanding is you've got pretty terrific uh, command support. Commanding officer on down. Does that sound right? Yes, it's very, very much so. So let your CMC know that I'd like to give him a call maybe and uh, get some pearls from him. I will do that. All right, thank you, Shipman. Thanks. Love it. Great conversation. Let's see how that conversation is transitioning into social media. MC1, how's it going in there? It's awesome. And that was a great question from Macon Island. And I actually have one that can almost relate to it. It came from Mandy Hadley Eklund, and she wants to know, why can't we start a program for dual military parents who aren't married for co-location? That's almost hard to understand. Dual? Yeah, dual, no. yeah. dual military, so two, dual military, two people together with a not child. Married, not, not married, but with yeah. a child. Right. Okay. With, with, with a child, child without a child. With a child. <laughs> with the child. With, with the child. child. So, so a couple married. with a child unmarried. Yeah, a program. Right, we, so we have the, um, 
the um, co-location, spouse oh, yeah. colo program so entitlement. Uh, to, to help the detailers better uh, assign uh, them together, together for duty. Because right know. now, if you're married and you say yeah. that, uh, hey, That's I'm right. going here, can my spouse, right, right, right. Right, the detailers work that out, but we don't have that for unmarried couples. I don't know. I, I guess, guess we, we take, take that one back yeah. and ask Millie. Yep. Got okay. it. Okay. Good, Good point. point. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. <laughs> It is the playoffs. We started with the softballs. We're throwing some heat now. We're a little different. All right, our next question is coming to us from a naval aviator who's seen the world from a view that most of us have just, just dreamed about. I'm Navy Commander Reed Wiseman and crew member of Expedition 41 on the International Space Station, orbiting 260 miles above the Earth. My heartfelt greetings to Admiral Greenard and to Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Stevens, and of course, to all of my shipmates currently deployed around the world. First and foremost, I want to wish everyone back on Earth a very happy 239th birthday of our Navy. I can assure you that our pride and traditions are living strong here in space where I am conducting research with my crewmates, including fellow fighter, fighter pilot and Navy Captain Butch Wilmore. Over the past five months in orbit, I've had time to reflect on my good fortune, and I am grateful more than ever for my experience in the Navy and what it has done to prepare me for this most unique opportunity. As U.S. Naval Aviators, we have continued to reach new heights and have paved the way for generations to come. I am very honored and proud to be part of our unique Naval heritage. I will close today with a question. As the Naval Aviator currently stationed furthest from where you are located, what is your vision for the future of unmanned aviation platforms and how will that impact flight officers? Well, I think the simplest way to describe that is to go to the highest altitude and work our way down for unmanned aerial. So today we are building an, and testing, we have built and testing an unmanned aerial vehicle called the Triton, which uh, has about a 70 foot wingspan, flies very high, 50,000 feet and thereabouts, broad, broad aperture out and around, looking predominantly on the ocean front to find various and sundry things. So it's a, it's a tune that looks kind of like a Global Hawk, which has been out there for years and years, but it has more capability, it can fly high, it can fly no, low, and it looks broadly out there and has a lot of different sensors. So that's your higher altitude. Then you move down, we have tested off of our, off the Theodore Roosevelt and the George Herbert Walker Bush, an unmanned, un, un, an unmanned aerial vehicle uh, launch and recovery. So it's a carrier launch. So imagine you can go anywhere in the world and launch this thing out there. If you don't have a person in there, if it's unmanned, uh, that's a lot of weight saving. You can put fuel, you can put ordnance, you can put sensors in there. So that is out there and we are looking at that follow-on. And then lastly, we have out there today rotary wing unmanned. There, it's called the, uh, the Fire Scout and we have two versions of it. One that goes about 100 miles, one that goes about 200 miles. Those are in production. We have, uh, lastly, a smaller scale. It's called the uh, the, the Surface Tactical Unmanned Aerial System, STUAS. And, and uh, our Navy SEALs use it, our Special right, Forces. So, you know, I apologize. And We're running about out of time. But I'm if you finished. Had to, oh, perfect, perfect time. And then if you've got a couple closing marks before we get to the celebration ceremony. Yeah, I want to say happy birthday. I want to say thank you for making your Navy the greatest Navy in the world. Uh, we will continue to be where it matters, when it matters. And what makes it all come together are the families, friends, organizations, communities, and our industrial base. Yes, sir. All right. Well, other than re-enlisting everyone, I know you. this is a special ceremony, bringing out the cake, and something that we enjoy doing with the Navy. It's personally one of my favorite parts yeah. of the Navy birthday celebration. And in order to, to meet the, the great guests we have in the live studio audience, this year we're going to be doing it a little bit different. Cutting the cake, we'll be using a cutlass that belongs to the Naval History and Heritage Command. It's been attributed to Admiral Farragut. This naval officer's sword from the early 1800s has a gold-covered metal hilt forming the shape of an eagle's head. The handle is made of ivory bone with carved decorations, and the blade displays an anchor and a ship on stormy seas. Thank you. Thanks for
All right. Excellent job, gentlemen. Appreciate you coming through today. I'm just kind of buying some time. That was pretty good. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you very much. On behalf of the Defense Media Activity, I'm Petty Officer Andrew Johnson. Thanks for watching. Now, which section is mine? The one that says all.